So you're probably watching this video because you wanna hire a sales team. But I don't think you should do this. I don't think this is a smart idea. And I'm gonna let you know why my legs are freaking killing me. Let's grab some coffee first. This is so much better, it's a lot quieter in here, and I'm not freezing my ass off. Anyways, what I was saying was, just like how we don't need this coffee, the real question is, do you even need a sales team? I could have been at home, made a coffee, it's a nice to have, but is it really a need to have? And I'm telling you, hiring a sales team could be one of the worst decisions that you ever make for your business. Even today, when I go on my Instagram, I get targeted by Richard Hughes appointment setters, Cole Gordon's remote closing academy, and all that. It seems like the trend these days is all about getting salespeople on board. And these people are incentivized to tell you this. Hell, I'm even incentivized to tell you this, but you know, since I really believe in true advisory, like doing what's right for people, I'm just gonna leak everything out. But even if you're not a ClickFunnels bro, a lot of people will still ask, do I need a sales team? And don't believe me? Here are some of my friends. Daniel Dwan over here, Vanessa Lau over here, legendary Scott Alford here or here. But does that mean that you actually need an inbound sales team? Is it the right direction for your business? When is it time? for you to hire this team and if you do how do you build one that doesn't completely destroy your business fortunately for me i've had the experience of being on an eight figure offer we were doing about 30k in ad spend per day 500k per week in revenue i almost got fired off the team and we did really really well to the point where we had over 50 sales reps constant turnover by the way and we watched that go from the rise straight into dumpster fire kind of like scarface if you've ever seen that movie i've also had the experience of working with your favorite click funnel bro or guru god worst decision of my life also have experience doing it right growing an agency treating people the way that they deserve to be treated as relationships not transactions god that freaking bugs the out of me okay so let's have a real conversation about a sales team but let's switch up the location so you see this orange cone over here? Basically, what you need to do is almost like a yellow light. You need to slow down and ask yourself an important question. What's more important, profitability or scalability? So quick story, being in high ticket sales myself, I once bought a 10K package from this guy named Scott Ulford. He's this very spiritual guy, one of the smartest business people I know, uh, who's very holistic. Some people might be like, oh, he's too woo woo, but that's what I like about him. He asked the question, do you want profitability or scalability? And a lot of times we get these things confused. We see a higher top line revenue and we're just like, great, we're making tons of money. Well, the truth is there is a cost to scale. And so if you want to scale, a sales team might actually make a lot of sense doing that. Don't forget, you have to pay these salespeople. You have to allocate anywhere from 10 to 20%. If you have appointment setters, you gotta pay them a base, some sort of commission on the back end typically. I pay my appointment setters anywhere from $1,000 per month with a sometimes 10% rate. And I try to pay people very, very well. But we forget that there's cost to all these things. It's scale is not just free. And I think in every business, as we're trying to scale, there's only so much that we can do by ourselves. If we wanna take closing calls by ourselves, we get stuck at a cap. And intrinsically, if you want to do more revenue, there's only so much that we can do. We only have 24 hours a day. That's when you need to hire people like an inbound sales team to actually help you scale. But is it a good idea? Based on my experience, hiring salespeople is one of the most, I mean, it's the reason why I don't have any hair anymore. I literally ripped it out. And remember how I said I used to be on a sales team that did 500K per month or 500K per week? That was insane time. We literally went through market exhaustion. I've never seen it happen other than my client. And there's some really crazy things that happened during that time. If you don't know, a lot of salespeople are very expressive, meaning <laughs> like they don't go based off logic sometimes. They don't update their CR. M's. If you ever studied like the Traycom social styles, they are a classic expressive. They go based off emotion, feeling, excitement. This is where you get all the old school tactics in the way and stuff too. It's really, really interesting. Imagine managing all these people, updating people like, hey, update your CRM. If they suddenly off board, they just disappear sometimes. We even had some salespeople back in the day. They would do some unethical stuff like instead of billing the client's Stripe account, they would build their own Stripe account account. I mean, they stole money from not only the clients, like the, the leads that they were speaking to, but they also stole from their, from the biz 
business owner too. And that opened up a whole can of worms. And that's the thing, like sometimes with sales teams, they're just so unpredictable. We even had one time, this other guy, he actually took all the lead information from HubSpot and our CRM and sold it off to the competitor, right? It's like, these are the type of personalities that you're working with a lot of time. You know, I'm not saying all of them, obviously, but a lot of them are very unprofessional. And that's something that you have to like keep in mind. And that's like what I used when I was building out my sales team. I only hire people based off trust. If I've worked with them before, I take note of how responsible they are. And it's really, really difficult to find really good help. But okay, maybe you don't want to hire a 50 person sales team, be a click funnels bro or anything like that. What do you do instead? Well, in my opinion, if you are going to hire a sales team, the ideal amount depends how fast you want to scale. But in my opinion, I think people can do quite a bit with two to three sales people, like solid sales people. I like to keep my teams very, very lean. And that's because I value profitability a lot more. And for me, I do it from a place of executive state, not survival state. So you won't see me talking about cash collected, using all these scarcity metrics of like pushing, 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 right? And something I learned from Vanessa Lau during her mastermind was the importance of culture. When you don't have a sales team, you don't need to worry about things like culture immediately, right? But culture is so important because it sets the expectations for the whole team, sets the vibe, right, for the whole team as well. And for me, when I run my sales teams, I like to set a, not a survival state, a high pressure state where people are like, you need to hit these KPIs, otherwise we're gonna decrease your priority and all that. It's a place of critical thinking, empathy, collaboration. Those are the vibes that I want because how does that translate to something like the sales calls. You know, there's a reason why so many people hate other salespeople is because of this high pressure survival environment. And so it doesn't surprise me that I've seen offers crash and burn because they had really, really aggressive salespeople who were in such survival, a trigger survival for their prospects. And it is freaking windy. So we're going to go back in my car. Culture sets everything. It sets whether people are going to screw you over or not, whether we have an abundance mindset or scarcity mindset. All this actually really matters quite a bit. And so how do you decide? how scalable you want to be, how profitable you want to be. Some things I like to think of is like, what kind of business is this? Is this a lifestyle business where you're just focusing on cash flow, Or are you planning to get acquired in like a few years or something like that too, right? Are you gonna sell out to Alex Hermosi, give him a part of your business? And for me, that's why I think I value very minimal sales teams because, you know, especially with like digital marketing agency, I have a digital marketing agency now. And like, you don't need a huge volume of sales people because there's recurring revenue coming in every single month. So the lifetime value of one client is crazy. You don't need to always be fishing. So that's something to be very aware of too, because you don't always need to sell. Sometimes you can always start another business that is more intentional for being sold off. But if it's your first business, you just want cash flow you see a high LTV lifetime value, then you probably don't need a sales team. Actually, you can probably just get away as a business owner like a lot of digital marketing agencies do already. The mistake that I see a lot of beginners make is that they think that a sales team is gonna save them forever. It's going to fix their conversion problem when really like we need to make sure that we optimize the systems first, we optimize the irresistible offers, and we optimize our general sales um, conversations, right? I don't like to call them sales scripts because it's like very traditional, but I like conversation. And so how are we gonna set the brand vibe? How are we gonna to talk to our leads or our potential clients that we're gonna to speak to? These things are all very, very important. And I try to be a lot more intentional about it these days. You know, it's really interesting. When I took Ali Abdal's part-time YouTuber Academy, he recommended this book called The E-Myth. And it had me thinking a lot more about systems. You know, when I was working the nine to five, I never really had to think too much about this. And when I think about systems, I think about how do we add more friction and how do we take away more friction? And when it comes to qualifying, we are so scared that we need to reduce the friction, get more leads. But in actuality, this actually wastes a lot of our time. This brings me back to one of my first clients. Oh my God. This is why I probably hate selling real estate or not selling real estate, real estate, but real estate coaching and all that. I had a client, I'll call him Darren, <laughs> right? Not my favorite time, but I remember him always saying, hey, there's money in this list. There's money in this list. And he did nothing to nurture this list at all. And the thing is, is like a lot of business owners will think that there's like money in a list that in the email list that they collected, but expect conversions when they've done no nurturing, have not done any content. There's no connection with the people that they're talking to. Right. And I remember 
we were wasting so much time with unqualified leads. Either A, they didn't have money, two, it wasn't the right timing, three, they weren't even our ideal avatar, right? Some of them were just interested in like buying real estate but not really doing syndication. Uh, that's what we were teaching at the time. And this is what happened. We had a whole bunch of us ready to take these calls, but whenever people would book, I'm not sure if it was an ads person or whatnot. It was probably a little, and I'm not gonna lie, it was probably a little bit of both of us. Like I was new, my team was new, but also the client was new too. And when you waste people's time like that, guess what happens? They turn, they turn over. They don't wanna do the project anymore because there's no benefit for them, especially if you're performance-based. And I think a lot of times with business owners and all that, especially with the commoditization of so many new closers, remote closing, inbound closing, high ticket closing, whatever you wanna call it. Truth is, for an inbound sales professional, like the whole concept of performance-based is, there's this famous quote by Peter Drucker, all profit is derived from risk. And us as inbound sales professionals, when we do a performance-based type of engagement, then we are taking all the risk. And that's why we don't take anything up front, but we should profit more. And usually a good starting number is, in my opinion, 20%, 15 is decent, 10%. I see so many applications saying 10% is abysmal. And if you don't wanna pay that much commission, that's fine. Pay your closers a base and take less of a commission. My point is if your funnel is kind of broken, there's a lot of no-shows or there's a lot of unqualified leads and you're working purely off performance base, it actually might cause you a lot more headache because no one wants to waste their time with a dead offer. And so if you're, you have a new funnel, you're beginning, you know, how do you increase the friction so you're not wasting your time if you're taking the sales calls or waste your inbound sales team's time? And I think about a few things, right? You know, a lot of times in traditional closing, they'll tell you, don't talk about money. Whoever talks first loses. But is that necessarily the truth sometimes? And I like to think about it, like when I teach my students, I like to think about it as a roller coaster. I'm terrified of roller coasters, by the way. But have you ever been on a roller coaster and you're going up and up and up? and you just feel this built-in anxiety because you don't know when the drop is coming. It's very similar to selling, where people will just delay the payment, delay talking about money to the very end, and they drop, and what happens? A survival state happens. They fight, flight, or freeze, meaning they <laughs> attack you with objections or might even argue with you. They ghost you, right? So they just leave the conversation, or they freeze. I need to think about it. Procrastination, right? That's where you hear all these things, but we don't realize that we're doing it. So what's the easy way to do it? Well, talk about money early. I like to bring up this term, minimum level of engagement, which basically means what's the minimum that you'll like do any sort of work for. You don't have to use those terms. You can be like, you know, I just wanna make sure that this conversation isn't premature. Just to let you know the minimum level of engagement for us is 2K per month. Is this a number that you can work with? You can also use price bracketing and all that, but I talk about it in my 500K script video, which you can check out later. Um, the other thing is like talk about timing, you know? Uh, on your application, right? When would you consider starting? That's something I think about. Create FAQs, right? Like, what are the most common questions that you get on your sales calls? And list them all out. It's a time to uh, honestly optimize your VSL to resonate with your audience. I don't like to waste time on sales calls. I like to think about like, you know, this is kind of market research. We're deciding what resonates with the audience, what doesn't resonate. And the truth is we get higher paying clients, better quality leads on the phone. And the truth is we're not wasting anyone's time which is so disrespectful in this time and age We're like we waste our clients time we waste the business owners time we waste our sales teams time a lot too and I know the first thought as a business owner you're probably thinking like oh Kevin won't I be losing out on leads and potential customers that like in the dating world because I went through a lot of breakups like <laughs> two years ago back to back <laughs> There's this quote I wrote down when I was like crying in my car and I wrote, suffering is holding on to illusion of what could have been. And I think spending time on sales calls with non-buyers, with people who are just, you know, that could be, I don't wanna say convinced. I hate the word convinced. Some people will say like persuaded and all that. But honestly, is that the real role for your sales team? I don't necessarily think so. And I like to think like there's this great book, The Catalyst. We have this idea that we can persuade, convince someone to buy or to make a decision that they never wanna do. And that's a big biggest misconception of something like sales. Because building that trust with that brand or the product could be better served doing something like content or like a guide or something else that doesn't involve our time. And if you do spend your time on something like sales calls, I look at it as like investing into your business. I, I remember talking to this OG closer one time and they were saying like, you know, new closers are 
weak, they're soft. We used to spend two to three hours per day, like per call, trying to nurture and persuade these leads. And no disrespect to the OGs out there, like because I do value wisdom and experience. But me, I'm a contrarian. I always gotta challenge everything, right? Cause I'm that rebellious kid. And I always think about like, well, is there a better way to approach things? Like I think a lot of times people don't think critically and just be like, well, is there a more efficient way? What are some of the potential reasons that we're getting for these objections, right? And to me, it's like one of the most dumbass things to just like keep on doing the same thing, expecting the same results. We can use this time to refine the assets in our business that don't require anyone's time to better refine our sales page, our landing page, our VSL, our um, sales conversations. Maybe it's our irresistible offer, right? Making sure that we have a solution from A to Z, making sure that we have a value-based offer, making sure that we have a high retainer offer. Like there's so many things that we can do and there's so much value in like that book, 100 Million Offers by Alex Tramozzi. And also one of my favorites that no one talks about is Pricing Creativity by Blair Enns. If they were to hop on and do some consulting for a lot of these businesses, they would freaking laugh at them. And the thing is, is this time that's used for sales calls and all that, we can use this to refine our VSLs, refine our target avatar to find out who are the people that I really like working with, build out FAQs and content, and just build the trust before the call. And when we build, when we take the time to nurture a relationship, not transactionalize it and worry about like, oh, what's your credit card number the whole time? We focus on doing what's right for our clients, which people can actually feel. They're not in a survival state anymore. And as a result, based off my experience, like you get fewer objections because you're not focused on on revenue, you're focused on building a relationship. And that one's major. I literally have people who, you know, I tell them, hey, I don't want you to rush a decision right now. Take your time, no rush. And they actually get back to me. I've had this like three months down the line, right? And it's so crazy that this happens, but this is what I mean by increasing the friction. Don't be scared to just put out like what your minimum level of engagement is. Don't be scared to disqualify people, right? It's not a scary thing. And then you just send them up the funnel. They don't belong down in the conversion side of the funnel because they're not ready to take action yet, to change quite yet, right? Step three, don't hire a closer, hire a inbound setter. So you're probably like at this point, like, okay, Kevin, I've optimized my systems. I have my irresistible offers unlocked. But Kevin, I'm so busy. I need some help. I need to free up my time. Don't worry, I got you. But the thing that you're probably looking for isn't a closer. You're probably looking for something like an inbound setter. Back when I was on that 500K per week offer and about to get fired, <laughs> I realized something really important. I suck a lot at closing. I wasn't good at skills. There was just all these soft skills that I just didn't have or mastered. I just didn't have the reps in quite yet. And so I realized I needed a lot more practice. At the time, I didn't even know what I needed to improve on, but I realized I needed some more practice with things like labeling, buffering, mirroring, tonality, redirecting. All these like small things and I would call it like sales riz. Oh my God, I can't believe I use that term. That's what the kids use these days. So the truth was I wasn't really great at closing at the time. And so I needed to still add value. I didn't want to get fired because it was my only income at the time. What did I do? Well, I basically made an offer that people couldn't refuse. I basically helped learn all these skills, take away the pressure of closing a deal and just learn how to do a really great discovery, a non like salesy discovery and just, you know, hand those help qualify and hand those like potential clients to the top performers of the team. I basically made my client ton of money just by helping them qualify their calls and just triaging. And I think there's like some valuable lessons in that. Okay, so what does this have to do with the inbound setter position? I don't think I've ever heard of people really talking about this, but in my opinion, this is one of the most powerful positions because especially when you are a solopreneur, you're probably doing all the sales calls yourself. There's a lot of fear associated just handing it off to someone else, like doing everything A to Z, especially if it's your first time hiring a sales team, it's probably better to hire an inbound setter instead. Again, they just help you kind of triage the calls. And as much as we like to think that there's like no risk when you're hiring a performance-based closer, the truth is there is a cost to outsource it. A sales guru with a three letter first name and three letter last name once told me, I'm performance-based, so if I don't make you money, then I don't make money, so it's risk-free. And if anybody approaches you with this methodology, you need to run for the hills. Because the truth is it costs money for CRM, the software, money to acquire the leads, especially if you're doing like pay 
paid media or hiring appointment setters. And then there's the intangible costs, like opportunity costs of converting a lead, you know, or like your brand reputation. If someone does a very hard style of selling and it doesn't resonate with your brand, if you're not like that type, then that could actually hurt you and hurt further conversions down the line. A lot of beginners don't realize, especially inbound sales professionals, is that hiring someone is very time consuming, it's costly, and it's a risk to the business. So one of the ways that I like to mitigate that risk is having a better transition plan by offering a inbound setter position. And this isn't a appointment setter that you see Cole Gordon or Richard Yu talk about on their ads. This is the difference. Appointment setting, you're DMing messages. There's a lot of different strategies, which I can cover in another video. The strategy I like, uh, leading with the lead magnet and seeing if we can book a call uh, just to build the relationship, right? And we generate appointments for the closer. I hate that word, by the way. And then there's the inbound setting position where you qualify, you triage the clients to the top performing closers so you can maximize the profitability of each call. In the sales world, they call it DPL, but really, which stands for dollar per lead, but this is actually revenue per lead, like if we were to use more professional terms with it. And this gives us actually a more hands-on experience with qualifying, speaking to clients, understanding the brand without the pressure of closing deals. Especially if you're like hiring someone new, a beginner, you really like their personality, or you're just trying to trial someone to before giving them all the leads. This is actually a really great way to transition over to a full-time uh, inbound closer or whatever you want to call it. But sometimes when people are hiring, they're just like, I need someone quick. I'm in constant pain. I need them to scale quickly. Oh, let's go into the last thing that you can consider. And it is freezing out here, so let's go back to the car. So what happens if you need to hire a lot sooner? You're in a bind. You need to, you have this deadline that you need to hire ASAP. So where should you start? Should you hire a recruitment agency? Should you ask your best friend? What should you do? And I actually have the story, this horrible, actually this horror story of hiring a recruitment agency or inbound sales agency. Basically, man, I'm not gonna mention the company, but it's a two letter, it's a two word uh, company. You know, they told us for $10,000, $5,000, they would help headhunt us to find closers that would fit for the brand. We can trial test them and all that. When we were interviewing people, we had a lot of retired people. We had a lot of weirdos. We had people that never done inbound sales and they were just trying to, you know, find us closers just so that they could collect the rest of their fee. And I filtered through a lot of them and a lot of them were horrible. Of course, there was a high turnover too. I'll tell you this, if you're looking for a quality uh, inbound sales professional in a short amount of time, it's really difficult because the best ones only work off referrals. For me, I only work off referrals, either off previous colleagues I've worked with. Uh, I work with business owners that reach out to me um, that have followed my brand and stuff. And if you don't have any of these, hey, don't worry. Um, it starts with meeting agency owners. It starts with meeting other, other sales professionals. And it, it starts with meeting other business owners all before you need them. I think the worst time to, like, if you're a solopreneur, like, you should just start building friendships. I hate the word networking, by the way, but you should just start building connections with people out in the industry way before you need them. And for example, when I hire salespeople or anything like that and make new friends, I keep certain people in mind. And I'm very selective with my referrals. Be very careful about like taking people's referrals too. You should just be very selective about the people you trust. The reason why I stress relationships throughout this video is because my good friend Vanessa Lau, she once said to me, your company starts with culture. And for me, everything starts with relationships. Everything from your first hire to the people that, you know, you speak to on the phones that might be your potential clients to the client engagement for the business owner that has a high ticket offer because everything is based off of trust. You want to make sure that people aren't going to scam you with their like by collecting payment through their own Stripe account. You don't need to worry about them selling off your, your leads to your competition. My opinion, it's always best to start slow, build trust. If you need help, feel free to reach out to me on Instagram through the DMs. Anyways, if you're ready to scale, you want to work with me. This is probably anti-CTA, but I will say, hey, don't go onto my page quite yet. Really, instead, you should take your time. Watch my video on exposing my own 500 k per week script youtube video exposing my scripts that i used when i was scaling that offer that i was telling you earlier um this way you can optimize your sales process before you even hire anyone it's my goal to just give zero cost education out there and just build better relationships with people anyways stay compassionate stay authentic stay rebellious peace